Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the sinking of SS Oregon, a Guian Line and Cunard Line ship that not only served in the Royal Navy, but also won the Blue Ribbon before meeting a terrible fate. To hear her story from start to finish, stay with us. Quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, wartime violence, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised for those under the age of 13. Please keep in mind that I'm not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I've done my research. Okay everyone, let's get into it. SS Oregon was a ship originally owned by the Guian Line, a competitor for the Cunard Line, White Star Line, and many other transatlantic shipping lines. At the time, ships were still going from Liverpool to New York City instead of from Southampton, which started later in the 1900s. On their Liverpool to New York City route in the early 1880s, the Guian Line had two ocean liners running this service, SS Arizona and SS Alaska. These two ships were incredibly fast, being record breakers that would both earn the Blue Ribbon at some point in their careers. The Blue Ribbon, for anyone unaware, was an official award given to the ships for the fastest transatlantic crossing. You could get the Blue Ribbon for either the westbound or eastbound crossing, or both. Though these ships were fast, there were only two of them, and so the Guian Line was only able to offer sailings every other week in each direction. In the off weeks, Guian Line used ships that were much slower, and so they figured they needed two extra ships for a weekly service. Cunard Line started to build a new fleet for their own Liverpool to New York service, and so the Guian Line followed in suit, ordering SS Oregon from John Elder and Company in Govan, Scotland, to keep breaking records. Just like her sisters, SS Oregon would be built at the Fairfield Yard of John Elder and Company, costing $1,250,000 in 1883. For anyone curious, that would cost $37,544,926 in 2023, so she was a large investment for the Guian Line. As for her specs, she was 7,375 gross registered tons, being 6.5% larger than Alaska as well as 4 feet or 1.2 meters wider than SS Alaska. But their lengths matched in order to reduce Oregon's ratio of length to beam and address some horrific vibration problems that plagued SS Arizona and SS Alaska. For imperial measurements, she was 521 feet long and she had a beam of 54 feet wide. In metric measurements, that would be 159 meters long and 16 meters wide. Being she was built in the 1880s, they were still building ships with emergency sails in case she were to run out of coal and be unable to travel by steam power, and SS Oregon was equipped with four masts. She had two funnels in between the masts that were painted black, and a white superstructure with a black hull. There are depictions of her with buff colored funnels with black tips, so it's up for debate since we only have paintings and black and white photos of her. Ships of that era were primarily built of iron, and it was the beginning of transitioning to steel ships. However, steel was still very expensive, and despite the fact the Guian Line wanted to make her out of steel because of the SS City of Rome being such a catastrophic failure for the Inman Line due to the fact that she was so heavy and she was built of iron, however, the steel was too expensive, and so SS Oregon would be the last iron steamship to earn the Blue Ribbon. She was built well, with nine transverse watertight bulkheads, a strong turtle back deck forward and aft to protect from heavy seas, and five iron decks. She could reach what was considered groundbreaking speed at that time, a speed of 18 knots, or 33 kilometers per hour or 21 miles per hour. To do this, she needed an impressive engine setup. She was equipped with a compound steam engine that had a 70 inch diameter, or 1800 millimeters, high pressure cylinder with two 104 inch diameter or 2600 millimeter low pressure cylinders on each side. SS Alaska's engine setup was only able to generate roughly 8,300 horsepower, whereas SS Oregon's engine could generate up to 12,500 horsepower. 
To get this horsepower, she needed nine Fox Patton double-ended boilers to supply the steam to the engine, and each was 16 and 3 quarters feet long and 16 and a half feet in diameter, which is 5.11 meters long and 5.03 meters in diameter. To keep these boilers going, she needed coal. Daily SS Oregon consumed 300 tons of coal, which is an increase of 50 tons compared to SS Alaska and 165 tons compared to SS Arizona. She had a single screw and it was 24 feet in diameter, which is 7.32 meters in diameter. The propeller shaft was made up of 15 separate parts comprised of crucible steel all fit together. Her capacity was 1,432 passengers split into three classes, and it breaks down into 340 saloon or first class, 92 second class, and 1,000 steerage or third class. On SS Alaska and SS Arizona, steerage was merely steerage and was treated similarly to other steerage classes, whereas on SS Oregon, her steerage passengers were upgraded to the illustrious third class, and they were given assigned berths in small rooms instead of free-for-all dormitories that were seen on other ships at the time. I know this can be boring to some, but we have to gush on the interior design for a minute because it was a step up at the time. The Grand Saloon, which was her main public room, was in the forward part of the vessel and was simply just stunning based upon description. Not only this, but it was described as, quote, capable of dining the whole of the 340 cabin passengers, so it was an enormous space, and it was said that, quote, the ceiling decorations were almost exclusively confined to white and gold. The panels were of polished satin wood, the pilasters of walnut with gilt capitals. The saloon measured 65 by 54 feet and was 9 feet high in the lowest part. A central cupola of handsome design, 25 feet long and 15 feet wide, rose to a height of 20 feet and gave abundant light and ventilation. This sounds like it was akin to that of Titanic, only 30 years before she'd hit the seas. It sounds luxurious, decadent, and simply gorgeous. I wish we had pictures of it. The staterooms were equally large, well-lit, and ventilated, and ventilation was a serious problem on older vessels, so the fact this one was so well-ventilated speaks volumes to her design. There was a drawing room for the ladies, and it was furnished in expensive pieces, as was the promenade deck space. The promenade deck extended the entire length of the ship, making it perfect for strolls to get fresh air. To keep true to her namesake, all of the woodwork in the principal entrance to the saloons, the ladies' drawing room, and the captain's cabin came from the state of Oregon. And on the upper deck near the entrance to the first-class dining saloon was the smoking room. This smoking room was decked out in Spanish mahogany and had a richly colored mosaic floor. Simply gorgeous. Her beauty wasn't the only revolutionary part of her design, either. She was the first ship to have dynamos and incandescent electric lamps installed. These lamps were supplied by the Edison Company. Her dynamos were badly damaged in 1884, and a well-known engineer who was working for Edison Machine Works at the time repaired them, Nikola Tesla himself. He'd just transferred from Edison's European company and moved to America. To ensure the dynamos were in perfect working order, Tesla stayed up the entire night repairing them, and he'd receive a compliment from Thomas Edison the following morning regarding his dedication to his work. Enough about furnishings. Let's get into SS Oregon's career, shall we? There isn't much here to note, but we can say confidently that SS Oregon set sail for her maiden voyage in October of 1883 and was slowly broken in before they'd attempt to go for SS Alaska's records. Sounds refreshing compared to Titanic, right? On April 5, 1884, she officially won the Blue Ribbon after breaking the eastbound speed record with a New York City to Queenstown run of just 7 days, 2 hours, and 18 minutes, averaging 17.12 knots. Unfortunately, despite the success, the Guillain line had been in a financial decline since January of 1884, when Stephen Guillain's older brother William resigned because of bad investments that weren't related to the Guillain line. They were unable to pay the shipbuilder, and so Stephen Guillain had to reluctantly turn SS Oregon back over to her builders. At the time, the shipbuilders were working on two ships for Cunard Line meant to beat SS Oregon, and so Cunard took the opportunity to scoop up Oregon themselves. She was a Cunard Liner as of June 7, 1884, and in August, she beat her own speed record. 
In March of 1885, the Pancheka incident happened, and this caused a massive Russian war scare over Afghanistan. The Pancheka incident, or the Battle of Kushka, was an armed engagement between the Emirate of Afghanistan and the Russian Empire in 1885 that led to a diplomatic crisis between Great Britain and the Russian Empire in regards to Russian expansion. In response to this, the British Navy chartered 16 passenger liners to convert them to auxiliary cruisers. And while 13 ships did undergo these conversions, only two were commissioned. The Union Lines Moore and SS Oregon. SS Oregon was very successful in this role because of her speed. And after this, the Navy began to pay annual subsidies to passenger lines to make sure that passenger ships were suitable for conversion like this. Think RMS Lusitania and RMS Mauritania. They are perfect examples of this. War fears would subside, and after this, SS Oregon returned to Cunard in one piece, resuming her commercial sailings on November 14, 1885. However, shortly after this, Cunard's SS Umbria and SS Etruria were completed, and SS Oregon was seen as redundant on the New York City Express service, and so Cunard was going to part the once irreplaceable ship on the Liverpool to Boston route. Finally, we've come to the sinking of SS Oregon. Know that there are some really foggy facts here, and I'll be transparent when information is fuzzy or just simply not available. SS Oregon was taking what was supposed to be one of the last of her runs to New York City, and she departed Liverpool on March 6, 1886, with 852 people aboard. There were around 205 to 235 crew members and 647 passengers, which broke down into 186 saloon class, 66 second class, and 395 steerage class. She also had 598 bags of mail and 1,835 tons of cargo aboard the ship, with Captain Philip Cotier mastering the vessel. The journey went fine across the Atlantic, up until she neared New York City. On March 14, 1886, at 4.30 a.m., just a few hours before she was to dock in New York City and about 15 miles or 24 kilometers away, there was a loud crash. SS Oregon collided with an unidentified schooner, which is more than likely the Charles H. Morse when we look at historical records. The schooner disappeared under the waves shortly after the collision, sinking with all hands. The reason that historians theorize these two ships collided is because the wrecks are only 16 miles or 25 and 3 quarters kilometers apart from one another, so it makes Charles H. Morse a likely candidate. But what happened to the Oregon? A passenger described the hole in the side of the ship as big enough for a horse and carriage to fit through, though the chief officer described it as just merely a glancing blow. Though he'd been on the bridge at the time of the collision, and he'd just barely seen the lights of the schooner before she rammed into SS Oregon. Several of the passengers who were quartered and sleeping close to the point of collision described it as sounding like a horribly loud crash. The crew made an attempt to plug up the hole using some canvas they had around, but it was unfortunately unsuccessful. Two hours after the collision, Captain Cotier ordered everyone to abandon ship, but there was one problem. This was before the Titanic disaster, and so there were 852 people on board, but only enough room in the 10 lifeboats and 3 emergency rafts for half that amount of people. The crew began firing off distress rockets to attract nearby vessels in the harbor of New York City. Of course, there always has to be something wrong in these evacuations. It seems like all of these stories I cover, the evacuation just can't go seamlessly. Well, in this case, at least according to first-class female passenger Mrs. W.H. Hurst, a group of terrified trimmers and stokers burst out from the boiler rooms and tried to push ahead of the women and children being loaded into the boats, and that the first boat launch was filled entirely with these men. Luckily, the officers in charge of the evacuation, as well as several male passengers, managed to rein everyone in and get control of the situation again. During the evacuation, a famous first-class cricketer named Charles Waller fell overboard and later drowned. It was uncommon for most to know how to swim at this time. He'd be the only fatality aboard SS Oregon. At 8.30 a.m., the schooner Fanny A. Gorham and the pilot boat Phantom took notice of SS Oregon's emergency flares and arrived on scene, boarding all of the passengers and crew from the slowly sinking ocean liner. At 10.30 a.m., the Norddeutscher Lloyd liner SS Fulda arrived, and everyone was transferred to her, going into New York Harbor. Eight hours after she collided with the schooner, SS Oregon sank bow first in 125 feet of water, which is 38.1 meters deep in metric measurements. For several tides afterward, her mast tops remained visible above the surface of the sea. 
after she sank, Cunard sent divers in to investigate the wreck and see if she could be salvaged. However, the hull had split open like a melon when she hit the ocean floor, and she couldn't be reconciled. Her loss amounted to a whopping $3,166,000, and this included $1.25 million for the ship itself, $700,000 for her valuable cargo, $1 million for lost currency and other valuables in the mail, and $216,000 in lost passenger luggage. SS Oregon's purser had saved Cunard Line some money by saving a large shipment of diamonds that were kept in the ship's safe. In today's dollars, the loss of SS Oregon would be equivalent to $102,175,240 in 2023. That's a massive hit for Cunard to take after just acquiring the Oregon and for her being such a new, innovative ship. In total, an unknown number of people aboard the unidentified schooner as well as one passenger aboard SS Oregon passed away. As the ship has continued to rot beneath the seas over the years, her hull and iron decks have collapsed in on themselves. However, her engine still stands 40 feet or 12 meters above the ocean floor near her nine boilers, which also still stand to this day. Rest in peace to the victims of the tragedy, and I hope we as a society can continue to tell their story and remember them, as well as learn from the mistakes of the past so it doesn't happen again. If you want to hear about another collision, check out our video on RMS Empress of Ireland. Thanks so much to our lovely patrons for subscribing and supporting the channel and myself as a creator. You guys are awesome and it really does help us out. If you'd like to support the channel and future episodes, go to patreon.com slash shipwreck Sunday to join. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us. And we are also on Facebook and Instagram. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the Sea Wing, an excursion vessel that met a horrific end on the Mississippi River in the late 1800s. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.